Well, first let me thank you all for coming here. Uh, today we're going to talk about, obviously, our use of force policy and it really and how it fits in to what we think is our primary responsibility. Uh, and I kind of want to lead into what our primary responsibility that will ultimately parlay into the use of force policy. Safety. I don't think anybody would take any issue uh, with understanding that our primary, our primary responsibility as a police department is to provide your safety and the safety of, of our citizens. So how do we do that? Uh, how do we measure that? It might be an accurate way of describing it. We do it a couple ways. Number one, we look at the crime. Crime is probably the primary way that we measure our safety. Uh, and when we talk about crime, we measure by the crime that occurred this year versus the crime that's, that occurred the following year. Was there a reduction in crime? Uh, so we compare ourselves to ourselves as it relates to how crime occurred from year to year. And then we look at regionally what happens in crime as it relates to what other agencies that are similar to us in dynamics, what are they doing as it relates to crime versus what we've done in, in our region as it relates to crime. And then we compare ourselves nationally to other major cities. As you all well know, there are about 45 major cities in America, major cities, a city of 500,000 or, or more residents, and we're one of those cities. So we look at their crime and what tactics and strategies that they're using as it relates to what we're doing and how do we compare it to them as it relates to crime. Uh, and then perhaps the most important and the one thing that we sometimes don't, uh, we, when I say we, I'm speaking of police department nationally, uh, forget to uh, use as a comparison the perception that the community has of crime. Uh, you know, I've, uh, I've attended meetings in some of my past assignments as a uh, police administrator and talked about the great decrease in crime and citizens have raised their hands and say, you can talk about all this decrease you want, Chief, but on my way to the meeting, I, was I felt really intimidated by individuals selling drugs at the corner, uh, individuals using, uh, using narcotics, people urinating, the alleys are dirty. So we have to deal with that perception because the reality of it is one's perception is one's reality. So, is one's reality. so we use those four components when we talk about crime and we talk about your safety. Uh, the centerpiece of that is talking about crime. Now, ultimately, in order for us to get our arms around crime, we have to focus on prevention. Uh, that really speaks to how effective we are in, in really uh, preventing crime. You know, and, and I know, and Noel and I talked, and I'm using Noel because we've had this conversation time and time again. We talk, when we talk about prevention, a lot of times, you will call the police, the police responds, we come, we're polite, we're courteous, you give us the description, we lock the person up, the person gets a conviction in jail. Uh, and I've asked citizens this all the time. Just raise your hand. How many of you think that is really good police work? That is prevention. A lot of them will raise their hand. Well, I take issue with that. Good prevention is you didn't call us because the crime didn't occur. That's going to lead us to this whole conversation today about our use of force and some things that we need to do different. Now, the 1,500 members on our department, in an effort to, for them, to get their arms around prevention, which is really the core of what we do, uh, what I see our responsibility is, they have to have a relationship with the greatest resource. And the, great re the greatest resource any department has as it relates to its responsibility in preventing crime are the residents that absolutely pay them to do their job. And in our case, it's between the 685 and 700,000 residents that live in our city every single day. And the bottom line is residents are more willing to work with us if they know us, if they trust us, if they treat us with dignity and respect. And ironically enough, the very residents that we need the most uh, are those that are living in neighborhoods and to, to, to a greater part to no fault of their own where a lot of crimes are occurring and where we put a lot of our resources. But those same residents are some of the same residents that have a lot of issues with our police department, with policing across this country. Just look at what has happened in Ferguson, what's happening in Baltimore, what's happening in New York, what's happening in Chicago. Uh, those are challenges that we're facing in policing. The bottom line is, I think citizens have raised the bar as it relates to what they expect from their police department as it relates to our responsibility to help them prevent crime in their particular neighborhoods. They've raised the bar, so I think it's only appropriate that we have to raise the bar also. Expectations have changed. Policing has evolved. And for us, that really means that we need to do some things different in our police department. I'm of the opinion, and I think many of you know that uh, I've worked in five police departments and I get to travel around the country talking about transformational change. Uh, so I, I am of the opinion, in order for us to do a better job in addressing crime, 
prevention uh, and, and building the confidence of the communities, particularly the communities that are most impacted by crime. There are some things that we just have to do different. Uh, I, you know, uh, I think I did an interview the other day with the media, and I was talking about the biggest one of our biggest challenges is trust, gaining trust in those communities uh, so we can work together addressing the issues that are relevant to them. So for us, that means that we need to change what we've done. We need to change how we've been doing things. And part of changing is this use of force policy. But you, I, I would ask that you understand the use of for, force policy is just a small piece of where we need to go or where we're going as an agency. So if you look up here uh, on the board, you will see that we're actually, our goal is evolving from a traditional uh, type of policing, which is what we've been doing across this country for 40 to 50 years, to a more dynamic and innovative approach in policing. So some of the things that we've done and will continue to do uh, in an effort to address the needs of the community and to build the confidence of the community, because I will tell you, if we're going to really be successful in really preventing crime, we have got to have the eyes and ears of the residents in this community, the 685,000, 700,000 residents, particularly those the residents that are really impacted by the crime. And those are the residents that we probably have the, the greatest challenge in trying to, to get on board to, to work with us. So in an effort to reestablish our relationship with them, there's some things that we needed to do. Uh, and what you'll see up on this board is just uh, a few of those things. If you look at the policies, you will see in an effort to kind of build that relationship, we had to change. We had to change some of our policies, shooting into vehicles, uh, individuals that, are, that, are, uh, that we make arrests and they're ingesting the drugs. Uh, and instead of aggressively trying to extract those drugs for them, we had to we had to do something different as it relates to that. Duty to intervene. When, officers, when one officer sees another officer doing something that is totally inappropriate, that officer has a responsibility to report that. Uh, uh, there's a decision-making model that I will talk about. De-escalation, which is part of the use of force policy, which I was talking about. Duty to render first aid. You know, I have a, uh, and I, I, I ought to give a story about Hill Street Blues. Many of you are too young to even know about Hill Street Blues, but I, I'm sure the, uh, uh, the chief of staff who's here, uh, Alan Salazar, he and I are probably familiar with Chief Ill Street Blues. I don't know if anybody else is familiar with it. But anyway, it's a TV show that came on a long time ago. And at the end of the TV show, uh, the sergeant would stand up like this, talking to the officers and saying, now what I want you to do is to be able to go home at the end of the day to your families. So when we talk about duty to render aid, those individuals that are actually creating a threat to us, other than it being a daily threat, those individuals are creating a threat to, to our residents. We want them to go somewhere at the end of the day, other than at the end of a bullet uh, that, in the head shot by a police officer. We want them to go to jail, get into the court system, to go somewhere. That's the sanctity of life. Uh, uh, and if they are injured, uh, and after making sure that it is safe, we, need, we have a responsibility to render first aid to them also. So those are the changes that we really have to make. And some of the things that we're doing to get there is uh, we, we have a brand new model as it relates to how we train police officers in the academy. Uh, we're in the process of spending uh, additional 40 hours on et ethnic training, implicit bias training, sanctity of life, I talked about that, uh, deal with mental illness responses in a, a, a more uh, empathetic, sympathetic way, uh, less lethal force, again, which will be part of the conversation on our new use of force policy, and how we deal with parties that are suicidal. Uh, so, all of those things are our approach of trying to build trust, to re-establish trust in the communities as it relates to them helping us get our arms around what I think our primary responsibility is, and that's the prevention of crime. Now, how does all of that, what that really means is what we have been doing traditionally has to change. Now, how does our use of force po policy fit into this change from traditional policing to dynamic and innovative policing? Now, this is all about the use of force policy. Uh, traditionally, this is what we've done. Uh, uh, we have been taught that as long as officers' actions are legal, they were generally doing things that are okay. Uh, and, and that's the frustration that I think that you see um, in policing across this country. You know, I, I'm kind of of the opinion, again, and, uh, and this is based on a lot of years of doing this and speaking to a lot of other police chiefs, uh, that we've operated on, uh, on, a, on a standard of legal for, for years and years and years, and that was the comfort zone that we were in. But I think we, we've got to evolve 
to a more dynamic and innovative, innovative approach in policing. So what we have what we've talked about and what we're training our police officers on is not just good enough to be legal when they make actions. We want those actions to be not only legal, uh, but to be necessary, to be appropriate, and to be, uh, and to be reasonable. Now, I've had the opportunity uh, to talk to over maybe 500 police officers in this agency with just me and the police officers, no supervisors, no management. And the one thing uh, that frustrates them and the one thing that we've talked about and, and I wanted them to understand is they, they're, they're a little frustrated because they're of the opinion that sometimes they're involved in something controversial, controversial not meaning right or wrong, uh, and they get blasted as it, as it relates to that. They get involved in a shooting and they don't get convicted uh, by the DA. They don't get they don't get uh, suspended or fired by myself based on or or my recommendation to the executive director of safety, and, and she concurs with that. And they don't even get suspended because their actions were deemed to be appropriate. But yet they get blasted in the media. Uh, they get blasted in part of the community. So what I share with them is. People are not really questioning. Sometimes they think they're questioning the officer's actions were illegal, but what they're really questioning is were the officer's actions necessary. So that's why it is critically important in our use of force policy that we're that we're going to uh, eventually have is we go from this legal standard and we train officers on the importance of not only making decisions that are legal, but making decisions that are necessary, that and that are reasonable and that are appropriate. Uh, so we're raising the bar, and uh, and we've talked about that. And I will tell you that most of the men and women of our department is pretty much on board with as it relates to that. So this new policy, we'll we'll talk about that in some great detail. Uh, additionally, uh, we are going to address stand your ground. Officers have, uh, and I've been a policeman for 40 years, and I was trained this way also. And unfortunately, of late, we've still trained officers on this. We train officers to to be trained not to, not to give up the ground when dealing with a volatile situation. You gotta stay on your ground. You gotta be like a, a, a cat that's been forced to be in a corner. You gotta react. The more dynamic uh, and innovative way of policing is have officers adapt to the situation while maintaining control, keeping themselves and others safe. Officers' ability to utilize additional resources and increase options. Don't stay on your ground is it's the old way of doing it. But what we want you to do is when you're in these situations, we want you to think, use your, use your intellectual skills, and don't be so rigid on saying, I gotta get a, re I gotta get a resolution, I gotta do something right away. We, we, we want you to maintain control, maintain control uh, and keep yourself and others out of harm's way. Don't rush into the situation. Traditionally, we have done under use of force. Inflexible, citizens complaint that officers very rigid and disrespectful. Uh, a more effective way of doing it is officers are now being taught to maintain control in a polite, professional manner while demonstrating heightened emotional intelligence. Simplest way to put this is uh, it's what I tell my, I have three kids. I have a wonderful daughter. She requires very little supervision, but I have two sons. They require a lot of supervision. Uh, and what I tell them is the same thing uh, that I have a lot of conversations with our internal affairs unit. We look at the complaints. And most of these complaints is a result of not what the officers say, but how they said it. You would be absolutely amazed the number of complaints that we get from citizens just basically that are based on the tone in which the officers address them. Uh, I've even had citizens uh, commend officers for giving them a ticket, but they commend them for giving, not for just getting the ticket, but how they approach them, how polite, how courteous, how responsive they were. And when they gave the individual that ticket. And then I've had citizens who got stopped by police officers, never got the ticket, got a warning, yet they registered a complaint because they didn't like the attitude and the rigid approach that the officer took in addressing them. So uh, we're really, uh, really uh, advocating and, and, and demanding that officers understand the importance of uh, being respectful and how, and how impactful that is and being impartial and understanding it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Traditionally, Hurried response, uh, regardless of the situation and the possible <coughs> danger to all parties involved, officers were well trained to resolve situations as quickly as possible. And they, they, done it, they do it quickly as possible for a couple of reasons. Number one, so they can get back out and start answering more calls for service. A much more dynamic 
an innovative way of doing that is when possible, it also taught to slow down, slow the response to the situation, allow for critical thinking. And, I, and many times, this really is a, it's a safety issue for individuals that are, uh, that are being victimized as it relates to this, uh, individuals that are suspects as it relates to this, and to the officer's safety. So we're really encouraging officers to uh, don't be so quick to jump into a scenario without thinking through where you are. Now, I was a, uh, a SWAT commander in Washington, D.C. for many years, and, and part of our training was to, when we get into a, a barricade or, or hostile situation, to really think through the situation, slow down, secure security area, make sure we're safe, make sure everybody else is safe, do everything we can to see how we can de-escalate this situation versus trying to get an immediate response that can sometimes only escalate a, a bad situation into being worse, traditionally. Enforcing, officers react to crime. They focus on eradicating crime through enforcement. This often is referred to as they say it's a war on crime. It really should be a war against crime. Dynamic, innovative approach. Enhance crime prevention through relationships with the community. Officers who are an uh, integral part in the community are sought for hiring and training. Uh, the bottom line is, you know, and this is, <laughs> I, I thought about this today. I don't know how this is going to go across. You know, we, we, we get hired, uh, and, and as police chiefs across the country, we say we need more police officers. Uh, uh, and, and sometimes I think people think that we, we need more police officers so we can respond, so we can have a better response time to, uh, to, to these calls for service and we get criticized, our department like most departments, uh, there are certain individuals who criticize our response time and don't think that we're getting there quick enough, don't think that we're making enough police, uh, enough arrests. But think about it, we want more police officers so we don't have to make the response time, we, uh, so we don't have to make the arrests. That's the prevention part of policing. You know, you. Some of us think that officers are being hired so they can have a, a quicker response time, uh, so they can make more arrests. Technically, if we're doing it right, officers should be hiring so the response time goes down because there are less calls to go to. The arrest goes down because we've done things interacting with the community, integrating our relationships with the community uh, that will result in using the intelligence that they give us that will actually prevent crime from even occurring, traditionally. Uh, is that, was that the last one? So, you know, the, the, this is what's gonna come out as a result of this. This is, uh, uh, we've been questioned greatly uh, by a few that seems to get the attention of many. How come uh, you're not a proponent for community engagement? Well, there could not be a more inaccurate statement. I'm a great component for community engagement. And some of you are going to leave here and you're going to go talk to individuals who you know that will give you a different perspective of this policy, uh, particularly as it relates to community engagement. Because they will, they will say that community engagement is our responsibility as citizens to make sure that we have a relationship with the police department to the degree that we even need to help write the policies. I've heard them. I understand that. Uh, and to, to a, a lesser degree, I agree with that to some, to some extent. But given the magnitude of this particular policy, you uh, be mindful that this policy that we're going to put out as a draft, by the way, has uh, implications on about 10 other policies that we have. So one of the things that we had to do prior to even getting it where we can get the community input is look at all those other policies that are implicated that has some implication behind this particular policy. So my staff spent a lot of time looking at those other policies, making sure that these pieces are all kind of connected. So we, we've done that, and in an effort to get community engagement, which I'm a great proponent of, what we decided to do in this, in this particular case is uh, send out a draft of this, of this policy to the entire community not just those that are constantly kind of criticizing us on community engagement, community engagement, what that means. So I, I think we've got the policy to the point where we've addressed the implications that it has on all the other policies that are impacted by this to the point where I feel comfortable enough where we can send this out to the community. And this is a policy that's been well tested, by the way, by many police departments across the country, by 21st century policing that, that on task force that was done by uh, that was done by, at the direction of the mayor and by PERF, which is a police executive research board, uh, board which, looks at, which looks at best policies across the country uh, and creates uh, best practices across the country, which I'm an executive member of that board, by the way. So 
this policy has taken all that in consideration, but what it hasn't taken in consideration is the diversity of our, our community and the community's uh, opportunity <coughs> to have a voice in what we do as it relates to this and why we do it. So after factoring in all those other nuances, is all the other policies and factoring in what else is going on around the country as it relates to use of force policy, we've come up with this draft uh, that, you will, that you will also have a copy of, and we're asking the community to, to look at this draft and if they have any thoughts or perspectives uh, that they want to share with us that will help enhance this, uh, they can go to DPD planning at denvergov.org uh, and we'll track all that information and we'll review that information. And if it's in the best interest of this community as it relates to use of force and if it's something that the men and women in our department can do, we will absolutely insert it into the final copy. Questions? How was the rollout here with training your officers and when you actually hold them accountable to the standards of right. your own one. Is that, that's, a great, that's a great question. We're going to, uh, I wish I had my training director here. We're going to probably start training them even before it gets into a final form. So uh, now I'm going to commit him to it. He's not here. Uh, I would say that uh, within the next two or three weeks, we'll actually start training officers. And actually, those officers that are in the academy now, the recruits, they've, they've been getting a, a uh, a taste of what's expected of them as it, rela as it relates to this policy already. But as it relates to all the officers that are, are currently on the street, that will probably start certainly by uh, no later than the close of this particular month. Uh, again, uh, and prior to the policy being released, we are going to have to retrain or educate the entire department <coughs> in relation to how we expect for them to implement that policy. So you think it'll take a year before they're actually Held account. Like how long will it take? Well, you know, what, 1,400? Yeah, well, officers? actually, we're authorized 1,503, so I like to use that number, but you're right. The actual bodies that we have is probably somewhere closer to 1,460 or so. Uh, so it, it's going to take, it's a, it's a top priority. So I, I'd, uh, given it as something that we control, I would say that within six months, everyone should probably be uh, pretty much trained on what needs to be done and how to implement it. How long are you keeping this kind of open-ended um, opportunity for the community to either provide their input perspective or their additions? How long can that? Well, actually, all of our policies, you can actually go on, online and look at those policies. And if somebody wants to, to weigh in on it, we certainly will take that. But as it relates to this particular opportunity to do that, given the significance of this policy, it's really why we're doing that. So when, when there are policies that we think really have a uh, a significant impact on the community at large, uh, I, I certainly would not be opposed to uh, putting in a draft form and giving the community an opportunity to, to comment on it. You talked a lot about other departments in other cities that are implementing some of these things already. I'm just curious if there is a city that you look at as like, if we could be like them, that would be great, or is it just... Yeah, there is. What city? You ready to write it down? Yeah. Denver. <laughs> And I and obviously, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with almost every major city in America. Uh, uh, and some of them do it better, and some there's some things that are done in New York that we uh, that we duplicate. There's some things that are done in Washington that we duplicate. And I will tell you, there are many things that are done in Denver that those departments duplicate. So uh, I, I'm very proud, uh, you know, and, and this is not to say what we were doing was wrong. I think we have a responsibility to compete, to always evolve and figure out how we can do things better and more effectively. And, uh, and I, I say with great confidence that we're probably one of the more progressive uh, departments in the country. Yes, sir. Chief, do, have, have some officers expressed concern that, that changes to what <coughs> they're able to do is, is going to put their lives at now, risk? Uh, uh, no, they haven't, but uh, that's not to say that they won't. But I, I think once they get the policy and they read it carefully and we train them uh, and do a thorough job in training them, uh, I, I would say, and hopefully they will say when it's all said and done, it actually puts them in a better situation. It actually makes them safer. So instead of rushing into a, 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 a dangerous situation when you don't have to rush into a dangerous situation, uh, we're going to give them some, some tools to evaluate it uh, more effectively. Uh, to, to use time and distance and space to their advantage while at the same time not compromising the, the severity of the scenario that they're being confronted with. Uh, so uh, in, in the long run, uh, 
this policy will actually make it safer for police officers. But yeah, initially I think when they get it and they look at it or they, they, see, they see this interview, there will probably be some that will have a lot of questions as it relates to their safety. Then it becomes our responsibility to allay those by making sure they have the accurate information. And then I wanted to ask you a question about accountability too, because if you're an officer that's been doing things this way for so many years, sometimes it's hard to change. And if you get into a situation <clears throat> where you're making quick decisions and, and they use the whole yeah, that, policy. You know what, that, 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 is a, that is a great question. You know, and, and the fix to transforming police departments is not just policies. We, we have to change what we value. We have to change what we reward. Uh, uh, we have to change who gets promoted and why they get promoted. So I, I, I think once, and we've been doing this for, for five years, by the way, there are, there are 100 policies in the, in the Denver Police Department, and there's members of my staff back there, uh, that their responsibility is to look at every policy that we have. How progressive is that policy? Is that, is that, is that a policy that is a tra traditional policy that's outdated, or is it a policy that can, that, can trans that can be transformed into something that is innovative and dynamic and meets the, the standard the bar that's been raised by this community. So we're looking at every single policy that we have. And I think officers are seeing that. I mean, officers who get reward traditionally, and, and uh, uh, we have an award ceremony. And traditionally, and it's not just this department. I've worked in five departments, and I know about almost every major department. And also gets involved in a shooting. It's a justified shooting. So at the award ceremony, you also get some medical. That's, that's the culture. Uh, so the change is now an officer's involved in a life-threatening situation, and the officer doesn't shoot because the officer used time, distance, uh, <coughs> and space to his advantage, and they de-escalate the situation. That's the officer that's going to get the award. And the officer at a war ceremony, I was one of those officers in Washington, D.C., make thousands of arrests at the war ceremony. You get, a, you get an award for making so many arrests. <coughs> Traditional, a more innovative way, and, and, and the message you want to send, you have officers that are connecting with their coworkers uh, that has the same precinct that they have, and they're working with the community, and they're working with things to prevent the crime from being occurring, so they wouldn't have to make the arrest. Those are the officers that should be getting the medals at the award ceremony. So it's changing the culture, and I think when officers understand that the culture is changing and they understand what we value uh, and how they're going to be successful, I think they will automatically, and some it takes longer than others, because change is tough, uh, they will automatically understand this is how we do things now. And they will get on board as it relates to that. When did you give this policy to officers? It, uh, the command staff probably had it, I don't know, maybe a month ago. Uh, and we went back and forth as it relates to that. The officers uh, received it today. How long might the public, how, how long will it be before the public realizes, hey, there's been a change? And I'm not just talking about hearing it, you know, seeing it, but, yeah. but actually seeing the results of it. And, and, and the city council <laughs> seeing the results. Yeah, of it too. you know, uh, again, that's a great question, and you can you can kind of you can help us out as it relates to that. Well, first, as it relates to this policy, until February the fourth, so it will be out, and people will have until February fourth to give feedback as it relates to that. Then, as it relates to how long will it be uh, before the, the the public sees the change? And I will tell you that uh, my direct supervisor, that's one of the more frustrating uh, concerns that she has. She understands that we've made a lot of changes in our department in the last five years. But there are just parts of the community that really uh, don't see those changes. They don't understand those changes. So that, now that becomes our responsibility, my responsibility, men and women in this department you see sitting back there, our responsibility to continue to connect with the community, to show them what we're doing, explain to them what we're doing, making sure they have a voice in what we're doing. Uh, that is a big ship. It's like changing the culture. It's a big ship trying to turn around, and it just doesn't happen overnight. But it's opportunities like this uh, I, I think that will slowly kind of resonate. We have to continue to do these things. We have to continue to give them an opportunity to have a voice in some of the things that impact the quality of life in those particular neighborhoods. I have to continue to get those six district commanders, uh, and they've done a phenomenal job, to have an advisory board of citizens to represent the other citizens at large in their geographical area, uh, to meet on a regular basis, to hear what they have to say, and to exchange with them uh, what we're doing as relates to our responsibility to ensure that their communities, that their neighborhoods are particularly safe. I mean, we just got to continue to uh, to knock on the doors and to, to tell our story and to listen to what individuals have to say and figure out how we can work together uh, to get their confidence, but really all for the purpose of preventing the crimes from occurring.
How will you measure success? Are you going to look at if your use of force numbers drop, or do you have another way to measure that this is effective? I, I, uh, I measure success uh, maybe not so much by, I mean, numbers, uh, we, we use numbers, but I measure success by perception also. Yeah. What, uh, you, you go into a neighborhood that's been uh, challenged uh, socially, economically, uh, and from a crime perspective. And from the crime perspective, what do those residents think about their police department and our efforts as it, as it relates to that? See, because if, if, if the residents really don't feel connected with us, and if they don't feel that we're out there uh, listening to what they have to say, it really doesn't matter how much crime we decrease because we're still dealing with the perception. So obviously we deal with the numbers, and I, and I, and I, you know, I, gave, you four, I gave you four examples earlier how we measure crime as it relates to numbers, but we also have to really deal with the perception of crime. So, uh, you know, where we were last year to this year, what's happening in our region, what's happening to other major <coughs> cities, and what is the perception of the community, and how engaged are we with that community? And does the community, to go back to, uh, uh, to the other question that was asked, does the community realize what we're doing? So else? with that, just a point of clarification, because you're saying that officers will likely be trained here starting in the coming weeks. It'll take about six months or so to kind of get the department all on board with this new draft policy. On here it says, <clears throat> excuse me, that officers, or this will not be in effect until officers receive this training. So are we anticipating that this policy will be what's in the books like by mid to late summer? No. February the 4th, people will have an opportunity. We, we welcome their input. So okay. we're going to take all that information on February the 4th, uh, and I will tell you in less than a week that information will be re reviewed and anything that's going to be uh, uh, entered into the final draft will be done within, within the week following February the 4th. I, I'm looking at the, the captain back there who has a responsibility. He just sort of cringed a little bit when I said that. <laughs> so, with, with, so within a week of getting the feedback from the community uh, and from the officers, uh, we're going to take a look at that and we're going to formulate a final draft. Uh, we're going to formulate a policy as a result of that. So there will be a policy in place at the very latest, late February, March the 1st. Okay. Yes. Are you changing discipline policy to match this? Is that. I mean, we, like as you all know, we, that you use well, there's a, there's a matrix uh, right. that, that's in place, and that was something that was certainly negotiated and, and, and worked on uh, certainly prior to, to my time. Uh, there's some wiggle room in that matrix that permits you to, uh, to mitigate some things or to aggravate some things uh, based on the scenario. So obviously, we'll, we'll use the gray that we have in the, in the matrix to either mitigate things that are occurring that are consistent with our policy or to aggravate those things. But we're pretty much uh, uh, governed by having to live by that matrix. Anything else? Great. Hey, again, I sincerely appreciate you all coming here. Happy New Year and certainly safe travels back to your, to your workstation. Thank you, Chief.